<laughs> but what what yeah. no? <laughs> I, 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 I. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joey Ito, director of the MIT Media Lab. And on behalf of MIT, I'd like to welcome His Holiness the Dalai Lama back to MIT. As many of As 
As all of you know, the Dalai Lama and MIT have established the Center for Ethics and Transformative Values led by the Venerable Tenzin Priyadarshi. And it's dedicated to the inquiry, dialogue, and education of the ethical and human dimensions of life. And as we also know, the Dalai Lama has always been very open-minded and collaborative with scientists and business leaders around the world. But I think it's a very interesting moment because as we see advances in scientific understanding of the mind and the body, this relationship um, is uh, increasing and coming much closer. And the surface area, I think, is, uh, has a potential to uh, increase and create a tremendous impact. And so I think it's a very important moment for us. Also, as the world is going th through this tumultuous journey right now, the role of ethics and compassion is playing a pivotal role in the value-based leadership that we need to survive this um, rather difficult period. And so as the work of the center continues to connect the values of His Holiness to scientists and business leaders through relationships across campus and the world, I think we're having an increasing impact on the world. My lab, the Media Lab, um, we have a uh, academic program called Media Arts and Sciences. And in the arts, led by Todd Macover, we're, we have a collaboration with the center called um, Vocal Vibrations, which is using music and arts to try to deepen our understanding, collaborating with the center. I'm teaching a class together with Tenzin called The Principles of Awareness, where we're thinking about mindfulness and learning about meditation. And it's this really wonderful feeling seeing these inquisitive scientific minds of MIT grapple with a notion of mindfulness as we practice meditation every day. And it's just this very um, um, wonderful thing. And, and, and at the Media Lab, we have now this year implemented a, 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 a rule in our thesis that every single thesis has to have some contribution to wellness. And so as we see science sort of approaching wellness, suddenly um, I, I think the interest um, on um, what the Dalai Lama Center has um, to offer is, is, is increasing across campus. So I think this is a, a historical moment where the scientific method of Buddhist philosophy and scientific direction and the state of scientific inquiry are, are coming together in this kind of Cambrian moment and sort of an explosion of discovery that will happen. So we're extremely excited to have His Holiness here now and very much look forward to the discussion and continuing the work uh, with His Holiness Tenzin and the center. Thank you very much. I would request uh, Professor Stephen Hall, Chair of Faculty, to present one of the few things that His Holiness cherishes while he's on stage. <laughs> Good afternoon, Your Holiness. It is a tremendous honor, delight, joy, privilege to have you back here. I also welcome all of you, our virtual guests who are watching the live webcast, and about 700 high school leaders who are on simulcast just in the next auditorium from us. Your Holiness, during your visit in 2012, we discussed several topics ranging from secular ethics to systems thinking. Our last global systems meeting touched on issues and challenges ranging from healthcare, economic meltdown, climate change, to food security. The center continues to have global engagements with its various programs around ethics and leadership. Could I have the Columbia slides, please? Our recent, most recent engagement took place a couple of months ago with the leaders of the Arahuaco community in Colombia in South America. A community of over 150,000 people who have lived in the mountains of Sierra Nevada for several centuries and whose habitat is now endangered by the effects of climate change, mining, and other challenges. I would like to take this opportunity to remind us all of the interconnected world we live in and the impact that our thoughts and actions have. The leaders of the Arawako sent their greetings and concerns in the form of these simple threads tied in a knot to remind us all of the deeper relationship we share. 
Your Holiness, I bring this to you on their behalf to start the deliberations of this meeting. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Deborah Ancona, Faculty Director of MIT Leadership Center and Distinguished Professor in Management at MIT Sloan. Thank you, Tenzin. Good afternoon, Your Holiness, panelists, members of the MIT community, and visitors from around the world. Welcome to the first part of our program, Global Systems 3.0, Equitable Solutions for a Changing World. The focus of this first part of the panel will be on a topic that continually gains importance, prevalence, and a need for action, climate change. Two years ago, we met on this very stage, in this very venue, to discuss the problems associated with, with climate change. Food security, water safety, changes in the ocean's ecosystem, health risks, and many kinds of pollution, including the spiritual kind. Unfortunately, the demons of denial and monsters of inaction continue to haunt us. Yes, the science is indisputable. The planet is still heating up. Glaciers and sea ice are melting. If allowed to continue, the results will be catastrophic, resulting in mass migrations, political instability, and a change to the very reshaping of the planet. In short, there is every reason to be scared. Yet in today's session, we want to focus on what is possible now. We are at a crossroads, and we have a choice to do nothing and reap the consequences, or to reach out to mobilize others and improve our lot, to live in fear or to move with hope. Today, we explore the choice of hope. We have economic and technological solutions available to us. We can do something. We can make a difference. The problem is that we don't. The problem is one of inaction. This forum, here on this stage, we carry the message that it is everyone's individual responsibility and moral obligation to engage in collective action to stem climate change. It is not enough to act individually, to learn about the problem, to talk about the problem, to change our light bulbs, yes, even to give up our cars. Individual action is important, it is critical, but it is not sufficient. We need to organize collectively to engage and generate systemic change. We, may, we must engage in what we at the MIT Leadership Center call distributed leadership, the idea that each and every individual needs to act as a leader, working in an aligned way to shift entrenched interests. Our governments are not doing it. And up to this moment in time, we are not doing enough. It is time to step into this void. Let us start this vision of hope as we watch the recent rally in New York where hundreds of thousands of people gathered to demand action. The People's Climate March will take place two days before President Obama and world leaders attend a climate summit at the UN. Climate change will bring more extreme weather and action is now more urgent than ever. Millions of people around the world gather in the largest climate action march in history. The biggest gathering seeking to address climate change ever. 2,000 rallies in 162 countries from Paris, Melbourne, Australia, Rio de Janeiro. And the activists are filling the streets to demand action on climate change. We are here because we are redefining this moment, this movement, this time. I want to thank all of the marchers today for coming together and taking a stand. We need you. We're all 
solve a massive people's march. I hope the leaders of the world listen. We're the first generation to feel the impacts of climate change and the last that can do anything about it. Our citizens keep marching. We cannot pretend we do not hear them. We have to answer the call. And with that, Your Holiness, let me introduce our panelists, who will each speak for five minutes, five minutes apiece. Uh, John Sturman, professor at the MIT Sloan School of Management, who will discuss why these people are marching. He will talk about the threat to our future, the challenge that we face. But then we want to quickly move on to the story of hope, where Rebecca Henderson from the Harvard Business School will talk about the fact that there are economic and technological possibilities. And then on to Professor Marshall Gantz from the Kennedy School, who will demonstrate what we can do, the power of collective action. And after that, we'll ask Your Holiness to engage the panel in conversation around the question of what can we do, bringing his spirit of hope and possibility to the rest of us. And with that, John, please get us started. Thank you very much, Deborah, and uh, Your Holiness, it's really a privilege to be here with you again and continue the conversation. So you just saw 400 plus thousand people marching in New York demanding action on climate change. And some are asking, why did they gather there? I think the more interesting question is, why aren't we all gathered there? Why aren't there more people gathered there? And how do we communicate such a complex topic as climate change in a way that remains grounded in the science and yet motivates action. So it's fallen to me in four and a half minutes now to present the science. Good luck. So the deniers and the vested interests would have you believe that climate change is not happening or it's not certain, and in any case, it's going to be far away in the distant future so we don't have to worry about it. That's just plain wrong. It's happening now already. We have events like Superstorm Sandy with 200 people nearly killed, 65 billion in damage, the drought in the United States clearly associated with climate change, the heat waves and fires in Russia and in Greece and in Australia, billions of dollars, tens of thousands of people dying from these events, Hurricane Katrina, Typhoon Haiyan, and we can go on and on. Here's a statistic that I think ought to scare you. The World Health Organization says 7 million deaths per year are caused from air pollution. That's an eighth of all the deaths every year on the planet. And the vast majority of that pollution is coming from the combustion of fossil fuels. So it's already happening now. We've already warmed the planet more than 0.8 degrees C. Can we bring that screen back, please? Thank you. And so what I want to do with you now, rather than tell you more about the science, is let's stabilize the climate together. So what we have here is a simulation model that I and my colleagues at Climate Interactive, go to climateinteractive.org, and you can get this model and try it yourself. We've developed this simulation model based on the best available science. And what we're going to do now together is see if we can create a safer climate for our kids and our grandkids. Now, the graph here shows emissions from the year 2000 to the year 2100. This is carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels. Now, the first thing I know some of you are thinking is 2100? Are you kidding me? I don't even know what I'm doing after lunch. The students out there and the youth in the other auditorium, you're thinking, I've got midterms. I've got you know parties to go to. I've got to get a job and get into college. 2100? This is not far away. So if you're a high school student today, as our youth audience is, you might have children if you choose to do so, I don't know, sometime in the next 10 years, perhaps. 
your life expectancy if you were born around the year 2000 is about 80 years if you're privileged to live in an affluent country. So you're likely to live to the year 2080, and your children who might be born in the year 2025 are going to live well beyond the year 2100, and your grandchildren well beyond that. This is not theory at all. So let's stabilize the climate. This is business as usual. This is where we're headed if there isn't a dramatic change, a tripling in emissions. And the projection is that that will cause the global average temperature to rise by nearly 9 degrees Fahrenheit, 5 degrees C, but I'm going to do Fahrenheit today. 9 degrees Fahrenheit by the year 2100. The green line there, that is the goal that all the countries of the world have agreed we must not exceed. Now, that green line doesn't mean that it's safe. It's just much safer. Climate change is going to cause more harm than it already has, even at that level of 2 degrees C or 3.6 Fahrenheit. But we're going to blast through that level by around 2040 and head up towards 9 degrees. Now, you may not think 9 degrees Fahrenheit is a big deal, but let me tell you, during the height of the last ice age, right here where we are gathered today, right here, there was a glacier a mile high. Sea level was almost 400 feet lower. And the global average temperature at that time was only 9 degrees colder than it is today. So let's stabilize that climate. What we can do is we can stop the growth of emissions. And as I move this slider, we stop the growth of emissions in the year that's indicated. And as I do that, you'll see the temperature begin to change. So let me hide that for a second. In what year? Do you all think, let's ask the audience, Your Holiness, in what year do you all think we ought to stop the growth of emissions? We'll fill the gap with renewables and efficiency. We won't be hurting our economic prospects, but we're not going to be using fossil fuels to do it. So in what year do you all think? Is 2052 good enough? No. More earlier? How about 2036? No. Earlier? How about 2018? That's just a couple of years from now. How's that sound to you? OK, do you think that's going to do it? We're going to hit that target? No. Take a look at that. We blast right through the target just a few years later. We've created a safer world, but it's nearly 6 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it is today. That's going to cause potentially devastating impacts. So what do we have to do? We're going to have to cut emissions. We're going to have to cut them dramatically, starting pretty much right away. We're going to have to cut deforestation. We're going to have to restore our forests. And if we do that, and there's no time to waste, we can hit that target. But there's no time to waste. The current system is not taking us on that path. It's taking us to a path of destruction. The question then is, when everybody understands the challenge, how do we overcome the fear? Because what I always hear now is, OK, that's what would be needed, but it'll kill the economy to do so. It'll hurt jobs. It'll destroy our competitiveness. That's not true either. And now my good friend and my colleague, Rebecca Henderson, is going to tell you why. So my job is to tell you that this is not a technological problem. This is not an economic problem. This is a social and political problem, and I have four and a half minutes to explain why. So first, it's not a technical problem. We have the technologies to dramatically reduce energy demand by increasing the efficiency with which we use energy. To give you a sense of the order of magnitude, the UK and Japan use about half as much energy per unit of output as America and Canada. It, the projection suggests that if India were to suggest to adopt leading edge energy efficiency technologies, they could use 40% less energy by 2030. Simply using energy more efficiently is a well-established pathway to changing our future. And it is effectively free. Or rather, it pays you back right away. A recent study by that well-known out there organization, the Department of Defense, <laughs> established that to build buildings in such a way that they're lead silver, 
That means properly insulated, the energy systems are working well. That adds about 1% to the cost of the building. And you can expect to see reductions in energy use of 5 to 30%, or a payback within three to five years. My best leading indicator are the real estate developers who come to the Harbor Business School for programs, also well-known out there lefties. They are routinely considering energy efficiency, demand reduction as they build new buildings. It's just good business. So the first pathway to do this is getting much more efficient in the way we use energy. The second path, of course, is reducing fossil fuel usage, moving away from coal and oil and gas. We need to move to hydro, to nuclear, to wind, to solar, to geothermal. And there's really good news there, too. Costs have been dropping like a stone. The cost of wind has fallen by over two-thirds in the last 25 years. Solar has dropped by 50% in the last five years. Next generation nuclear power, a bunch of it being developed right here at MIT, the projections suggest that it will cost 60% less than current nuclear, while simultaneously burning up the waste from old nuclear power and not generating any new waste and being much safer. Looking forward, it looks as though wind will be cost competitive with coal within the next 10 years, solar within the next 15. And I was a professor of technical change here at MIT for 20 years. I think if we decided to do this, costs would come down much faster and the technology would improve much faster than we think. So even just as a conventional pointy-headed economist and technologist, we can do this transition. And of course, I haven't been talking about the costs of not doing this. Because burning coal is not free. John told us that we have millions of deaths every year just from the cost of air pollution. Burning oil and coal and gas is imposing huge costs on our children. An estimate from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences suggested if we do nothing, by uh, 2095, the cost of the economy will be about $12 trillion a year. That'll be roughly 10% of world GDP. And that doesn't take account of the misery and the death and the habitat destruction. Current estimates suggest it will cost maybe 1% of GDP to fix this problem, probably less. The most recent estimate says 270 billion, that's a quarter of 1%. And the costs of not doing anything are 3 or 4%. So this is eminently technical possible. It's not going to destroy the economy, rather the reverse. This is an economically smart decision. It's not economics. It's not technology. It's about people. It's about communities. And to talk about that, I'm going to hand over to my friend and colleague, Marshall Gans. Thank you, Becca. Uh, Your Holiness, uh, panelist, my mustache is never going to be the same again. <laughs> Thank you for that. In my work with social movements, civic associations, and community groups, I've learned that leadership really matters. But it's leadership of a particular kind. For me, it's leadership rooted in three questions posed by a first century Jerusalem scholar, Rabbi Hillel who, when asked, how do I act in the world, responded with three questions. Ask yourself, he said, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? That's not a selfish question. It is a self-regarding question, taking seriously one's own, one's own values, one's own resources, one's own choices. But the second question he says to ask yourself is, if I am for myself alone, what am I? Because to be a who, and not a what, is to recognize we exist in relationship with others in the world. And the third question he says to ask yourself is, if not now, when? The solutions to the problems we try to solve don't precede action, they flow from action. And getting into action without knowing the full solutions, but faith that you will discover them, requires hope, it requires courage. 
And so this kind of leadership is leadership of the hands, it requires skills, leadership of the he head, it's strategic, and most of all, it's leadership of the heart because it requires courage and it requires hope and it requires solidarity. Now, leadership in the service of deep change, what we might call structural change, the kind of political, economic, and cultural change required to deal with global warming is a power challenge. In other words, it's not a knowledge problem. We know what to do. It's a problem. It's a power problem. We've been unable to turn that knowledge into action. What do I mean by power? My goal may be to reduce carbon emissions, but it may require decisions by someone else, like an energy company, and their decision to shift from coal to green energy. But unless the energy company's goals, making a profit, for example, depend on some way on my decisions, why will they shift? I need them more than they need me. So how can I turn the tables? By myself, not very easily. But if I can persuade my neighbors to join me in switching to a different power company, it may turn out the power company needs our collective resources as customers more than we need theirs as suppliers, and things begin to shift. And if that works, we get not only one power company to change its practice, we've organized our community to act as one in achieving common goals. And that's how social movements, civic associations, and advocacy groups can turn resources they have, people, into the power they need, economic, political, and yes, moral influence, and in this instance, affecting corporate policy. Now, climate change, Dealing with climate change requires mobilizing power on a scale far greater than what it takes to change the practice of a single company. Fossil fuel companies who make money from creating the very problem we're trying to solve. Politicians influenced by contributions by those fossil fuel companies. And even universities who benefit from investing in these same companies are all involved. But social movements are not only about economic and political power. They're not only about economic and political reform. They're about moral power and moral reform. They're about not only negotiating goods, they're about what is good. They're about the meaning we hold as individuals, as communities, and as institutions. And that's really where they get the power. That's where they can get their power. Changing the status quo always, re always requires recognizing that those who resist change will have more resources. But social movements need to be more resourceful, make up for resources, conventional resources they don't have with commitment, courage, time, and the willingness to take risks, and willingness to take risks in what they do. They're also about urgency, moral urgency, especially when the challenge they're trying to deal with isn't understood by the general public as urgent. But when a black woman named Rosa Parks refused to sit in a segregated bus, it created moral urgency. When students sat in seats reserved for whites only at lunch counters in this country, it created moral urgency. And that's where we come in. We have choices to make about whom to buy from, whom to vote for, with whom to cooperate, even which laws to observe. And the history of social movements from civil rights, the women's movement, the environmental movement, the early environmental movement, all demonstrate that when we mobilize people to use their resources together, it can make a big difference. Mothers Out Front here in Massachusetts is organizing moms to do exactly that, switch their energy company from one power source to another. 350.org organized people across America to raise the cost of the Keystone Pipeline. Greenpeace has organized people around the world for global action. In the Greens movement in Germany has made major, major shifts in, pu in public policy. And here in the US, as we saw, 400,000 people showed up in New York City to recommit to this cause. There will be conflict, there will be struggle, but there can be change. But we can only succeed if we act together.
Thank you. Now I would like to ask Your Holiness if you could react to what you've just heard. We've heard about the challenge from John about what's going on. We've heard from Rebecca about the fact that there are technological and economic solutions that will not bankrupt us. We've heard from Marshall about the call to action to join social, to create or join existing social movements. You travel around the world, you talk to people all the time. We'd like to know your response to what we've just said. Uh, if you could share with us some of the hopeful things that you have seen and some of your thoughts on how to move forward. Firstly, I want to thank these sort of ecology or global warming sort of specialist. You really make presentation because I'm very precise. And the statistics are there. Statistics. <laughs> oh. uh, my talk usually about uh, inner value, statistics share your money. I have no statistics to show. <laughs> 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 then we one thing very <laughs> obvious, the ecology problem, the global warming, these are so important. This is not a question of uh, one or two nations or one, one or two continents. This is a question of whole seven billion human beings' future. They are concerned. So problem, I think the concerned people short-sighted and look their own interest, their immediate sort of interest. Uh, even they may have some, some sort of the uh, awareness. No, awareness. Uh, the long-term consequences. But then still, oh, as, you, as someone mentioned, you pointed out it doesn't matter. Uh, this is something in future. Far away. I'm concerned now, uh, mainly dollar. <laughs> so here, my view is, I always tell people, the sense of concern of seven billion human beings on the basis of sort of concept or sense of oneness of seven billion human beings. And social animal. Long term, my own interest related with the rest of the world. So humanity, happy world generally, including ecology, happy, then I got maximum benefit. If world face some problem, no person can escape. Right? Escape. escape. Uh, so I'm simply one as a student of Buddhist sort of as a Long. Uh, thought, and we emphasis altruism, and altruism with action oriented, chinduya means the oriented one. Uh, altruism that must be translated into action. Uh -huh. So, so the motivation is, I feel, the most important. The proper motivation develop. Awareness, very important. So, these people, experts of clear presentation, really immense help to understand the reality and also understand consequences. Uh, then, you see, develop a desire, oh, I must do something as a part of humanity. Uh, so firstly, I think these kinds of meeting uh, more often mm -hmm. and make sort of public known these sort of say, reality 
Uh, then, at a practical level, I think like the, the demonstrations, uh, certain sort of Hosita, so like the New York demonstration, um, it's very important to show a public's sense of dissatisfaction with the existing situation. Uh, that's uh, necessary. Uh, I think two, two things. One, I think many cases, out of ignorance, they simply carry you see, their harmful activities. So for them, you see, these activities makes awareness. Then second, you see, sometimes people you see, knows these things, as I think you mentioned, knows these things, but uh, unless you see, something hurt, touches them directly, touches them directly, oh, not much sort of concern. So you see, some people's some kind of. Thing. Expression, expression, right. no, no, expression no. oh. strong expression. Oh. Boycott, yeah, sort of. Mm -hmm. For example, that may take the form of a more active form, like boycotting products of a particular corporation that has bad environmental records. Yeah. Then you see these people, who knows, but you see, uh, doesn't care. No immediate sort of effect on them, so they doesn't care. That's so it's right. some exactly. little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Non-violent way. Of course, non-violent. Oh, oh, then, <laughs> that, that's, <laughs> that's, I think, necessary. One time in Delhi, you see, we uh, uh, talk, you see, the less privileged people, including, let's say, the homeless people. Then, uh, then I told, I expressed, now maybe time come, some kind of mass or all city demonstrations or like that, and then make known the concerned people. Now this is something serious matter. Uh, so if you uh, decide organize such things, then I will join. <laughs> Demonstrate, <laughs> shouting, <Okay>. shouting. <laughs> <laughs> I told them, really. Uh, this, not selfish reason, but well-being of human being, humanity. But as you, as you, see, you mentioned, the, uh, so the human nature, you see, uh, parent, and then there are children, grandchildren, grand-grandchildren. So the parent, the present parent, should take some moral responsibility. That concern, I have no children, so no, no concern. <laughs> <laughs> you can be certain you're concerned for all children, <laughs> yes. not particular children. Uh. So, so therefore, uh, I think it, it, these things are not only kasuta, the practical sort of kasuta issue, right. Right. beneficial, right. Not practically beneficial. Oh. But morally, I think really, Kasota, uh, serious question about moral responsibility, moral or sense of concern of well-being of the rest of humanity and the coming generations. And the human population, according to some sort of expert, uh, so that they are sort of sort of prediction, no? they say, to, uh, today, about seven billion. And next, after a few decades, end of this century, human population will reach 10 billion. I think it may be possible. When I first came to India, then we used to say six billion. Now, after uh, 50 years, now we say seven billion. Uh, seven billion. So uh, the medical facility improve. So lifespan increase, uh, increase, uh, increase. So therefore, uh, the population itself 
And then also, it's a huge gap, rich and poor. It is totally immoral. Let poor people, let remain today's sort of poverty, these things. Totally wrong. Uh, we must sort of uplift their living standard. Then, you see, nature resources. These also, I think, in early, I think, uh, 80s or late 70s, one occasion in England, uh, uh, some, 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 serious some discussions. No. Uh, and uh, I sort of private or so just beside the big sort of meeting, a so few uh, scholars uh, with some chat, and they say the even present population, about six billion. The poorer section of people's living standard, and they, then, they, then they say the northern world and the southern world, huge gap. So southern worlds, their living standard raised up to northern world's standard. Uh, standard. Then nature resources already uh, questionable, whether sufficient or not. So now, 70 billion. So these are very, very serious matter, and also matter of moral principle. So the most, most important thing is, these people, uh, you should, speak out loud. You should, you should tell. Uh, speak out loud. Uh, speak out. And then I think televisions or media people also, I think, should be more serious. Uh, Attention. Not just advertising or picture of one beautiful girl. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Occasionally, you see, get some, some good. <laughs> uh, but, but serious matter, you see, must publish, must say. Uh, and then, not only just a negative side, inform negative side, murder, scandal, all this negative thing, but also, you see, must tell, must show positive side. Uh, we have, now, for example, this ecology problem. S mention seriousness. Meantime, we can do this, 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 to prevent or at least to reduce. Then people think, only so the negative side, uh, then they want to rise. Or maybe some uh, take very seriously, then suicide. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what sort of use. So they make clear all the sort of seriousness. At the same time, we have the sort of potential or ability to overcome this, at least to reduce this sort of danger, then give people more courage, more enthusiasm. That I think very, very important. That I, I feel, otherwise, uh, uh, I'm not now here, I'm a student to learn from you, from you, from you. <laughs> That's all, I have nothing to say. <laughs> so, you. your, your Holiness, you've said that this is an enormous problem, the, the population is growing, yes. and it is something, it is a moral responsibility to take these things on. And yes, the media needs to change, and yes, um, we need to create change. I'm wondering if you have some stories, and the, the panelists also have some stories, of how regular people can step up to try to make these changes happen, to begin to now, immediately, make, make, make change. change. I don't know, they, roughly, uh, many years ago, when Japanese economy still going that way, uh, then I told, I expressed, there's no guarantee the Japanese economy always go that way. So uh, it, is a, it is important right now think more sustainable economies think. And in India also, you see, I sort of express it. I'm not an economist. My knowledge about these things, as well as experience these things are just a zero, nothing. Uh, but seems to see uh, too many cars in big city, 
in rural area, quiet space, because of empty space, space. open space, but much less car. Real sort of development must take place in rural area. Then economy can be more sustainable. And I think the human way of thinking, emotional thinking, also maybe I think better. People in big city, I think their human feeling seems to say less. In the rural area, they're working, farming, or some other things. And the neighbors really feel feeling of neighbor. So when they meet, say hello, good morning. In big city, big building, when we met, morning. <laughs> hello, says Don't you the old one? No time to say hello. Just <laughs> walk on. <laughs> so I think the human feeling. Yeah. Oh, sometimes you see we human human being become like part of mission, like that. So the human friendship. These the people in the big big city. Oh, the money is more important than just his friendship. You know, in oh, so therefore, you see, the, uh, I think America, I think maybe OK, but the rural area development, uh, and because of that, less gap, rich and poor, then everybody feels happy. And this, I think, underdeveloped countries, I think, more serious matter than these things. I think that when you point to the significance of the human connection, that's the foundation of it all. In my experience, the pathway from thought to action mm -hmm. flows through commitment. But it's commitment not just to an idea, it's commitment to each other, mm -hmm. to other people. Yeah. And the power of collective action is in making those commitments to others so that we struggle together, not as isolated individuals. Mm -hmm. To me, that's foundational, and I think, I think understanding today there's a lot of romance with the, uh, with the social media, that through many, many clicks, clicking, we will make change. That's interesting. We can share information, but I think as you point to, the foundation is in the connectedness between people who can then commit to one another, decide with one another, act with one another, experience the support of one another, and learn from one another how to make progress on these enormous challenges. And that's how movements work. And that's one reason we're hoping one thing people can take away from today is the significance of struggling not alone, but with others, as a foundation for this, for dealing with this enormous challenge. Absolutely, yeah. that's right. Marshall, before we stop, could you perhaps uh, provide His Holiness with just an example from some of the work that you do of what, what that human connection looks like and what that movement is, is like in a, in a concrete example? I think His Holiness has a pretty good idea when he was talking about nonviolence, uh, and he wanted to caution me to be sure to be nonviolent. <laughs> One thing we know is that nonviolence works. And it works because it requires the cooperation of many, many people. A few people with guns can't do it. It takes lots of people committing right. to act together. And you know whether it's in the, in the, in the form of, uh, of boycott uh, efforts, as you describe, uh, efforts to get these universities to divest from fossil fuel companies. How can, how can they offer it? I, I, That's right. I mean, they, universities have not just a, a uh, um, what can I say, economic, they have a moral responsibility. They have a moral responsibility. They're supported with public uh, funds. They have a moral responsibility. Uh, students happen to be here. Um, I don't know. One day students stop going to classes, the university stops. I mean, I, I'm not advocating that. <laughs> but, but it's a reminder that whether it's, whether it's an energy company or a fossil fuel company or a university, these institutions depend on our cooperation. Mm -hmm. That means that we can always just say no. Not like Nancy Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> but more in the spirit of Gandhi, who said, 
we can always choose not to cooperate, and guess what? It begins to fall. My work in the civil rights movement revealed that. My work in the farm workers movement revealed that. My work with the dreamers uh, has revealed that. And I think the challenge before us now is to take those lessons and bring it to bear here. And, and as I said in my comments, there are groups right now doing all this. There's a mother's group right here in Massachusetts who's saying, look, this isn't about abstract issues. This is about our children. It's about our children's future. We're going to start by getting our neighbors to switch to green energy. That's an option here. We're going to try to get institutions in our communities to switch. We're going to try to get the state to act legislatively to switch. Th those, are, those are things we can do, and there's lots of them. Right? All right. Yes. <laughs> we <laughs> seem to be in harmonious in accord her, here. I, I guess I would, I would call maybe on Rebecca to perhaps, so Marshall just brought up that story, to just tell us a little bit about how that organization got started by regular people. Um, oh, Mothers Out Front? Yes. Um, and this is just an example of one. There are many. We're going to encourage you to think about them. This is just one story. So I hope she's not in the room because I'm going to embarrass her. But uh, a few years ago, I was sitting in the living room of a friend called Kelsey Worth, and we were talking about what could be done to change the course of history and to really make a difference. And she said, you know, all the mothers I talk to are really distressed about global warming. Mm -hmm. But they, they think about what's happening to the world, and they think about what's happening to their children, and they weep. And then they think, but I'm, I'm just me, I'm sitting alone in my house, what can be done? And what Kelsey did with other very committed, wide awake people is begin this organization called Mothers Out Front, which started with eight people in her living room and then joined up with 350.org and is now thousands of mothers across the state uh, taking, taking action. I'm always struck, it's these individuals. Can I tell a business story as well? You may. <laughs> so, um, I have a friend called Auden Schendler who works for a ski company, the Aspen Ski Company. And if you're a ski company, you're really worried about global warming because there won't be any snow. <laughs> That's a big problem. And so, he was thinking, what can he do? How can he help? And he worked with everyone else in the company to dramatically reduce the amount of energy used at the ski resort, but then, to join with environmental organizations to petition the Supreme Court to say that CO2 is a pollutant and should be regulated as a pollutant. And he was, the Aspen Ski Company was the first company to sign up, and then they got other companies to sign up, and other people engaged, and the Supreme Court ruled in their favor. And it, it all started with one person going, we have a serious problem, what can I do? doing individual action, but then moving out mm -hmm. to join with other businesses, other organizations. We always think it's someone behind the curtain, but it's, it's individuals mm -hmm. starting this and, and, and coming together. I, I have a, a complimentary example. It's a little different, uh, and it was in the New York Times today. Uh, in the New York Times today, there's a report about a meeting in Colorado of the fossil fuel industry with the Berman Consulting Firm from Washington, D.C. And in that meeting, the, 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 the report goes, uh, there's a very frank discussion of how to besmirch the reputations of those leading climate change movements. Uh, of, of, and I think the, the quote was, you got to play dirty to win. <laughs> now, there was one person in that meeting who said, not for me. He's the guy who recorded the meeting. He's the guy that turned it over to the Times. Or she. And so, or she. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, woo. <laughs> woo. Uh, 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 I guess I assume fossil fuel industry, but uh, <laughs> thank you for the correction. Yeah, it could well be. Um, no, uh, who, who chose, who was moved by their conscience that that wasn't enough. I mean, that that wasn't right. So now, pick up the Times today, you'll see the whole game plan of the fossil fuel industry for undermining the efforts that we're trying to commit to here. So this is a struggle, but it is a struggle that can be won in the ways we're describing. So, so let me add one story, and I want to particularly address this to the youth audience, the folks that we, uh, we saw earlier. 
Uh, I have a friend named Kim Wasserman Nieto. She is a Latina housewife in Chicago. She lives in the Little Village neighborhood. And she became active at the age of 21, not much older than the folks that are in the other room and not much older than many of you. Uh, and she got active because asthma was hurting the kids in their neighborhood, and that was coming from the two coal-fired power plants. The poor folks in our country live where the pollution is. And so she got active. She created the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization and built it over years and enrolled folks in it, and they succeeded two years ago in shutting down both of those coal plants. And I just want to... I just want to say that you don't have to be Auden Schindler who can bring a case before the Supreme Court. You don't have to be someone of our age. You can start right <laughs> now and get active and make a difference. Okay. And, and with that, I believe, uh, unless His Holiness has anything else to say, we need to, to wind it up. But I, I think the point we're trying to make is that it's up to us. It's up to every individual who's sitting in this room to do something not just alone, but to galvanize other people. And there are many examples. It can be done, and it can be done now. And to end, what we'd like is for Marshall uh, to lead us all in thinking about what each of us can do right now. Yeah, um, as, as we were saying, that the, the pathway from thought to action flows through commitment. And we'd just like to invite each person to take a silent moment here and just reflect on what kind of commitment could you make to work with another? Not just your individual, but what kind of commitment can I make to another, to another person, to work together on this challenge? Just take a minute and think about it, and then I'll tell you what comes next. <laughs> Just think about it for a moment. Now, Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor about your commitment. Don't keep it as a secret. Turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor. You can go both directions. It's okay. I know it's confusing. Or join, a, join someone. You can be three. And when you've made the commitment, and told your neighbor, would you please stand up? Stand up if you've made a commitment and told your neighbor about it. Please stand up. Please stand up if you've told your neighbor and you've made a commitment, you've told your neighbor, please stand. Commitments in secret are not commitments. We better stand up here, I think, as well. And give yourselves a round of applause, please. How about, how about an organized applause? Thank you. Thank you very much. After this program concludes, outside, the students are manning the tables and womaning the tables. Yeah, the, 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 the students are uh, managing the tables out there uh, uh, with a variety of organizations that are active. They invite your engagement. They invite your participation. But uh, thank you again uh, for your engagement, your participation your support, and thank you so much to His Holiness for inspiring with his example and his words and his wisdom. Thank you very much. When you came in, you were given a bracelet. Please tie it to the neighbor next to you.
with that commitment as a reminder. Yeah. Right, okay. Sorry. Do you already have one of these? Come here. Please be seated. And please join me in thanking the panelists.